homework, uh, a homework eight. The, the homework, the last homework seven, I had an issue. Rosie, are we doing okay on sound? This sound? Okay, I want this one, be sure this one comes out really good today because there's a lot of people gone, so I want the film quality to be really good. Um, the, I, I had a, a, a labeling issue on the plot for the Langmuir question on homework seven, where one column it said milligrams per ml, and the other one it said milligrams per liter. And so, because of that, there was like a broad range of answers and so I'm having them grade it particularly leniently. But some of you were way off and like didn't have a straight line. You should have known that there should have been a straight line there. The axes weren't labeled. So as long as it was in the right direction, we're gonna be really lenient. But I wanna go through another example. So the next homework has another Langmuir uh, question. So, uh, so we'll have a couple, because I definitely wanna test over that, but I wanna have a couple good examples before we're done. Yeah, question. About the what's yeah. The, what's the difference between plotting it normally versus plotting it as a line? Um, because the only way that you can determine these, uh, your ST and um, your K is when you plot this linearly. So if you know if I if you were to do a real example and you transformed it into one over QB, one over CB, this kind of linear relationship. So if you transformed all of your numbers and you plotted it and it still looked something maybe like this or this or I don't know, this, then you would say, this is not the right model for me to use for this data, right? <laughs> So, but, but this one was a good fit, so it should have worked, or, yeah. Um, okay, so keep an eye out for that. Um, then that'll be due a week from today. The other thing, so from last, qu from last class, there was the issue on the, where's my notes? Where are my notes? Here. So where we had defined Okay, and there was a question about the derivation of this. Um, we could have just as easily, and I, part of my mistake was thinking about this in terms of R1 being before and R2 being after. So like this delta R, right? Where what these really are, you, we could have just, we could call this Rx and Ry. Because what, R1 and R2 are the radii of curvature of the surface along any two orthogonal tangents, okay? It's definitely not before and after, okay? So, and this is, so then this is drawn entirely appropriately. I th if you look back on your notes from last time, I had superimposed some red lines here, thinking that it was R1 and R2, like thinking that this was misdrawn and that it should have gone out here, but this is, this is correct. R1 and R2 or Rx and Ry, okay? Um, so your book describes it on page 300 of the really big book. That's, that's a good section. I would go back and read. They, they, have, they have just two or three pages on uh, the Laplace equation, the Kelvin equation, and um, so it's right around page 300. Radii of curvature along the X and Y axes parallel to the surface is how they define it, okay? So, yes, and so what do they mean then by radii of curvature? It's like the inverse of the curvature, right? So if this is the curvature, where is the center of that radius, right? Where generally we think about radius being from a circle, right? But a lot of times on these, for example, if we had a capillary um, that had some water in it, or maybe a pore in a nanoparticle, right? There's not necessarily, there's a rate, this is the, the curvature, and then the radius of curvature would be that. But as we classically define a radius, this is not it, 
right? A, the, the classical definition of a radius is related to a circle, and that's not what we have here. So that's why this nomenclature is radius of curvature. Okay. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit more then about um, what we can do with this uh, Laplace pressure. Um, and if we think about making these kinds of droplets. So um, let's think that we have some kind of droplet of one with a P, P I and a P Z, P O, I'm sorry, pressure inside this droplet. pressure outside, right? And if the bubble isn't popping, there should be some equilibrium, right? Okay. So what the general expression is, is that the pressure inside is equal to the pressure outside plus this surface tension term. Okay. Um, so how could we then determine the work needed to form this bubble or to, to make a bubble of any given size? Right, we're, we would want to look at, if we're looking at work, or not volume, area. This is area. So our, our change in work is our surface tension times change in area. Okay. So... Is that, is that because gamma is dependent on R and work is defined as a force such distance? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's, I mean, if you think about where your the force is being exerted, it's being exerted on the surface of this particle not throughout the, the volume, right? There's really only this infant, this tiny infinitesimal part where it's interacting with the outside environment. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so if we think about then this DA term, um, so DA is AF minus AI, right? And we know that our radius final is radius plus dr, and our radius initial is just equal to r, right? So then our dA is 4 pi r plus dr squared minus 4 pi r squared. Yeah? Uh, why would you not use a surface integral here instead? Use, instead of the area, wouldn't, if it's like hydrostatic pressure, isn't it acting on the interaction? Um, yeah, but we're calculating the entire surface area. Right? It's right, yeah, if you have four pi r squared, then Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's there's this. I mean, if it was a non-uniform surface, then maybe you'd have to do that. But since it's completely uniform, I think we can get away with this. Yeah. Um, so if you do, if you do this, if you tease this out, your four pi r squareds are going to cancel, and you're left with eight pi r dr plus 4 pi dr squared, right? If we just multiply this out, we can assume this is small. And so our dA is roughly equal to 8 pi r dr. So then our change in work 
for a given material surface. Because so again, it would be a function of that material of interest. It's going to be a function of the original radius and the change in the in the change in that radius. Okay. So that might be important. Um, okay. So I was just going to do a couple examples today. Yes, we talked about this. That the pressure inside is the pressure outside plus the surface tension. Okay. And actually, as Let's look at a couple other examples here. So what do you, th so, actually let's back up. So for this Young's Laplace equation then, um, so what would this be for a sphere? Remembering that this is, R, this is the same as Rx and Ry. Right? Because in, in a sphere, the x and y are going to be completely equivalent. Right? So a lot of times you'll see it written like this, but that's only for a perfect sphere. Okay? So there's several other iterations on this, including if you had a bilayer. Right, so here this is an empty sphere. This is just a hollow, a hollow sphere where it becomes four gamma over R. Or if we had a pore, like a cylindrical kind of system, where there is no longer an X, or there is no longer, there's only an X or a Y, right? There's only one radius here when we have this kind of uh, nano wire or nano pore, right? We've we've lost one of these when we have this kind of system. Or if we go into a completely flat infinite, so if if ours if these go to infinity, right? That's what a that's what a completely flat plane would be, where the ours go to infinity. There is no longer a delta p. There is no longer a Laplace pressure, right? Okay. Okay. The vapor pressure of water at room temperature is 3.2 kilopascals and 100 degrees, I'm sorry, and at 100 degrees Celsius is 101.325. Right, so this is where the atmospheric pressure equals the vapor pressure. Calculate the pore size required to induce spontaneous condensation of water at room temperature. And then it gives you our surface tension of water. So this is one of the amazing things about nanoparticles. That I'll, there'll be another example, I don't know if we'll get to it today or if it'll be on a homework, where you, you calculate how much humidity or how much energy it takes to get water out of a very small pore, right? So if we have stuff loaded inside of a, like a 100 nanometer pore in a particle, it's actually very, very stable in there, right? Because there's essentially a negative Laplace pressure that's holding it in these pores. And so this is kind of asking the inverse question of this. What is what um, pore size do you need to induce spontaneous condensation? So you've got, say, you've got this nanoparticle. It has lots of pores, and then you put it in this sealed thing that has water vapor. H two O gas. So at what size of this? What size of pore to get H2O liquid? Okay. 
Okay. So what do you think, what, what, um, well, we can start with what we know. We know our, our delta P for sure, right? Delta P equals 101.325 minus 3.2 kilopascals equals 98.1 kilopascals. So this is just a basically another way of saying the um, saturation vapor pressure, right? We're not, we're, we're at 25 degrees C here. Right, the entire experiment is at 25 degrees C. So we're at 25 degrees Celsius, but we have 101.3 kilopascals of pressure. Internal. Yeah. Um, in at, in the flask, yes. Yeah, so we have a saturated solution. We have 100 percent humidity. Okay, so the outside air is not at 3.2 kilopascals, but it's at 1 101.3. Yes. But there's going to be a delta P in the pore. Yeah. So what equation then do we need if we're assuming it's going to be like this? Cylindrical. Uh, just a cylindrical. So our delta P is then that over R. And what are the units on this? 98.1 times 10 to the third newtons per meter squared. And this is 7.2 times 10 to the negative third newtons per meter. So then the radius equals 734 times 10 to the negative ninth meters, or diameter equals 1.5 microns. So it's a relatively big pore size. But we also have a really humid situation, right? We have a lot of humidity. So if this would, if this would decrease, if we would have less humidity, we would have to have a smaller pore in order to induce spontaneous, um, spontaneous condensation. Yeah. So should, it just gives us these two pieces of information, um, but would it actually have, a problem would actually say that this experiment is done at this pressure of 100? Yeah, this is probably kind of poorly posed, um, but, that is what it's saying, right? You're, you're putting it in this saturated 100% 100 humidity environment. Yeah. At 25 degrees C. Why is it 100% humidity? I know that probably should be obvious to me. But why does that because the, that's the atmospheric pressure, like pressure at sea level is 101.325. Okay. And so if the partial pressure of water is equaling the atmospheric pressure. Then, the then you have 100 percent. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, don't th don't think about it as if all of the pressure is from water, because when you have 100 percent humidity, you still have oxygen and nitrogen. Right. It's just that the partial pressure of water is equal to the atmospheric pressure. Wouldn't it mean the partial pressure of everything else would have to approximate zero? No, because you can have the, <laughs> what's the right way to explain it? Um, because the partial pressures are unique to each constituent, okay. right? And so the, you still, you'll still have nitrogen and oxygen in the air. It's just that you, the, the partial pressure of oxygen is equal to its atmosphere, or its, its uh, saturated vapor pressure, equilibrium pressure. It's in equilibrium, 100%. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about this one? 
that you have a bubble of air in acetone at 20 degrees C in standard pressure. Calcul this one I took from the book. This one I found in the book. And the book, God, for whatever reason, used units of dynes. Dynes per centimeter squared. But don't worry, it's no big deal. A dyne is a millinewton per meter or a millijoule per meter squared. Um, I decided on this one, I'm gonna let you guys bring in a note card. So I think that's a, like a, a cheat sheet because there's a lot of these kind of rinky-dinky um, equations. So I think we'll do a cheat sheet on this one. Um, okay, and it gives you the surface tension of acetone. Does this make sense? So the surface tension of acetone is more or less than water. Do you remember water from the last one? It's less. It's less. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? You've messed with acetone. It's highly volatile, right? There's no, could you imagine one of those water bugs like walking on acetone? No, right? Okay. For several reasons. What? <laughs> For several reasons. For several reasons, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so what do you think? So, well, first of all, what equation are we going to use here? It's a spherical situation, so our delta P Okay. Um, so we know Calculate the internal pressure. Um, professor, yes. How would you differentiate between the sphere and the hollow sphere? Because I imagine a bubble of air is a That's a good question. That's a good question. I mean, I think the, the answer is that there's no kind of surfactant here. So if we look, if this is, if this is all acetone and this is all air, the monolayer is only going to be that. Now, if it was something like a soap bubble or something like that where you had the membrane was made up of something like that where there, was, there were polar head groups and nonpolar head groups, there's only two things here, I think is the short answer. Whereas if it was a situation like this, um, you would have phase one, phase two, and then essentially a phase three to make that shell. Okay, so we can put this in uh, do, 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 do. 23.7 millinewtons per meter. And now what do we know our R is? 0 0.002 millimeters. Okay, and so I'm just gonna show this. You certainly don't have to. A thousand millimeters in one meter, and then a thousand millinewtons in one newton, just to have the units cancel properly equals 237 newtons per meter squared, which is the same as 23.7 kilopascals. Okay. But that's the delta P, right? This is our pressure across this system. That's our delta P. So we're not done yet. What else does it tell us that's kind of hidden in there? That we're at standard pressure. Okay, so that is what? Yeah, but I mean that is our, in our our outside pressure, right? Our, so we also, so this is our delta P. We also know that our P 
naught or outside pressure is 101.325, which is the same as one atmosphere, right? So then our internal pressure Okay, so we're taking our outside pressure plus our pressure from the surface tension, our delta P equals 125 kilopascals. And that makes sense, right? If we, had if we have a bubble inside of a liquid, it has to have more pressure. Think about all the bloody, the, all of this pressure that's pushing down on the inside of this air bubble in here, right? So it has to have a higher pressure on the inside than on the outside. Okay. We're still not done with this question. Um, well, depending on how you, yeah, I guess we kind of are. Um, if we were just to express this as a percentage, you could also express this as a percentage of um, 23.7 kilopascals over 101.325 kilopascals. Right, roughly equals 24% higher. Okay, so I think one of the homework questions is to plot how that changes as a function of radius, to look at different R values and look at how that changes, yeah. So for the last question, that it was last it was cylindrical. Mm -hmm. If you see the word pour, that's code. That if you see the word pour, think cylinder. Yeah. Okay, simple stuff, right? I mean, the math is super simple. It's just a matter of getting the defining your terms properly and knowing what the problem is asking. Okay, this one takes it to the next level. Then let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay, I'll let you read it. A drop of water is forced through an aspirator. You've used an aspirator before, or like an atomizer. It's basically you, you, what about a nebulizer? Remember the old perfume bottles? I mean, I don't even remember, but you've probably seen them in cartoons, right? Pepe Le Pew. Um, and so that's what you're doing. You're pushing a, a, a material through a very small membrane. People, you might also hear the word extruder. People use extruders to make liposomes and uniformly sized liposomes. So you take a mixture of uh, lipids and uh, maybe some cholesterols and you shake it and you make these micelles, but they're generally all different sizes and shapes. And so you push it through something known as an extruder, which has uniform pores. And as you push it through, you come out with very uniform products, okay? And that's kind of the same thing that an atomizer or an aspirator or a vaporizer does. It just takes a, a liquid and pushes it through a very small, that's like why Pepe Le Pew has to put some applied pressure on that vaporizer, right? In order to push the things through here, okay? So the question is saying you're taking a one ml of this stuff and making a lot of tiny particles. And what happens when you do that? Okay. <laughs> Calculate the amount of work in millijoules to increase the surface area from that one centimeter drop to aerosol particles with one micrometer, cubic micron volume. How many drops are formed? 
what is the new surface area? What is the specific surface area? Okay, so we've got a lot going on there. Um, so we want, one of the questions is wor want work. And we remember that that is our surface tension times our change in area. Um, we also know our friend there, again, is our surface tension. We also know that we have a one centimeter cubed drop. And we can, this is equal to one ml. And we know that one cm cubed pi r cubed is the volume of that. So if we know the radius of our original drop, radius initial equals 0 0.62 centimeters. OK. And we know that these one micron drops by the exact same math have a volume of 0 0.62 microns. Okay, I just took this volume, set it equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed, and solved for that radius. Okay. Um, okay, so how much, how many drops then do we have? That's one of the most first things we can do. Just dividing the initial volume by the final volume. That's right, yeah. So we have 10 to the, if we have, we have, so, we're going from a 10 to the sixth quantity to a 10 to the minus two quantity, right? CM microns. Thank you. Okay, this is our volume final volume initial. Okay, so our only difference is this factor of 10 to the minus 4, right? But it's 10 to the minus 4 cubed. So we know that we have 10 to the 12th particles. Okay, that's just the kind of hand wavy way to do it. Like if you really wanted to you would set, you would take this radius final and then convert it to centimeters and then set that equal to this and solve that out, right? But it's just 10 to the 12th. Okay, so that's one question that it asked, how many particles? What is the new total surface area? Okay, so our surface area then of one particle is four pi r squared, 0 0.62 microns for one, which is equal to 4.8 cubic microns or 4.8 times 10 to the negative eighth cubic centimeters as opposed to cubic microns. And so then the surface area total is that number times 12, which is 4.8 to the fourth. Okay, squared. So think about that. This is rough, this number then is roughly 
200, it's more than 200 centimeters by 200 centimeters. That's a lot of surface area to cover with one, one mil of water. Right, if you were to, this is this, the surface area of one droplet times how many droplets we made. And so you get 4.8 times 10 to the fourth centimeters. So if you s imagine this, that surface, that's 200 by 200 roughly, right? It's a lot for one, one mil of water. Imagine trying to smear out a mil of water like that. Okay, what is the new total surface area? We got that. We still haven't answered our original question, calculate the amount of work. Okay, so for that one, Work equals 72.8 millijoules per meter squared times 4.8 times 10 to the fourth. Okay, remember this is just our delta A. And technically, what, it, what am I kind of doing some hand waving on here? Delta A should technically be, but what is our initial? It's one, like a slightly more than one centimeter cubed. It's one centimeter, no, that's our initial surface area. So our initial, our surface area Initial is four pi points point six two centimeters squared, right? So it's roughly four four minus four point eight to the fourth, right? So that's why I just ignored that. Okay. Um, equals three hundred forty nine millijoules. Okay. And what's the last one that we haven't answered? What is the specific surface area? So then specific surface area is just gonna be our 4.8 times 10 to the uh, fourth centimeter squared over one gram of water. It's weird to think about this. It's kind of weird that they ask this specific surface area for something like water. You generally think about specific surface area for solids or substrates, because water is generally what you're putting on a material, right? But 4.8 meters squared per gram. Is this a lot or not a lot? I mean, it's all relative, yeah, but what were we think, what did we calculate for, remember when I was pumping your stomach, how much, how much surface area did that have, or how much did our silicon have? Like silicon, it was thousands, right? Like charcoal was 3,000, and um, those silica, porous silica particles were uh, hundreds and hundreds, okay? Um, okay. I don't want to transition into Kelvin equation, so um, I think we're going to pause here. This is a good place. Who wins in terms of best Thanksgiving trip? Probably none of you, probably none of us, or we're all here. <laughs> the best person in my lab is going to Mexico City. Can anybody beat that? Yeah, he wins, he wins. Okay, well have a good break. Uh, that homework's not due till Wednesday, so if you want to zone out all weekend, you've got the time to do that. So